Huawei, one of the largest Chinese tech companies that has recently become public enemy number one in the eyes of the USA. This situation is understandable. Huawei's shadowy practices and controversial management style have made it an easy target for the West. In this video, we'll see all the strategies Huawei used to go from an unknown startup to a global technological superpower in the span of just 30 years. This video is brought to you by Dashlane. Keep all your passwords safe by registering with the link in the description. Huawei came about in a turbulent time for China. In 1979, the country was in many ways stuck at a major crossroads. Only a few years had passed since the death of chairman Mao Zedong, the founder of the Chinese Communist Party, who had dominated all aspects of China during his reign. Unfortunately, his aggressively optimistic policies often did more harm than good, and by the time his reign was over, China was left isolated, underdeveloped, and expected to enter yet another period of massive poverty and famine. During the few uncertain years after Mao's passing, there was a power struggle within the Communist Party on who would be his successor. Ultimately, it was Deng Xiaoping who emerged victorious and became the de facto ruler of China. Now, Deng was a very contradictory figure. On the one hand, he was one of Mao's earliest allies during the revolution, yet unlike Mao, he was actually a competent economist, which allowed him to realize the shortcomings of his predecessor. Although Deng maintained communist rhetoric and the structure of the Communist Party, he initiated significant economic reforms in 1979, which to many of his fellow party members were dangerously close to capitalist treason. Deng began decollectivization, the process in which assets and industries owned by the state were contracted out and owned privately. The reforms were, of course, very popular and very successful, as production around the country became more efficient. China created its own private economy, in addition to its state-owned enterprises. The shift in Chinese policy was not just internal, however. China also opened itself up to the world, establishing much-needed foreign trade relationships. In 1980, the Chinese government established the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, which, as the name implies, is a special area carved out exclusively for international trade that made great concessions for companies that could not be found anywhere else in China. Unsurprisingly, entrepreneurs from across the country flocked to the small city of Shenzhen to pursue their business, driving up the city's population from 300,000 to over 4 million in the span of just 20 years. One of those entrepreneurially minded individuals was Ren Jianfei, a member of the Chinese military and Communist Party. He was a survivor of Mao's mass famines in the late 1950s, who left his rural province to join the Chinese military. He was no regular foot soldier, though. Instead, he served as a member of the Liberation Army's engineering unit that would build many advanced factories for China as part of Deng's economic policy. Ren Jianfei would serve the People's Liberation Army dutifully until 1983, when his unit was disbanded and now left out of a job, Ren had to pivot into the civilian economy. With his skills, it was pretty easy to find work, which he did with the state-owned Shenzhen Electric. He worked there for four years until he decided to start his own company, Huawei, in the Special Economic Zone, thus giving a clear indication that Huawei would be oriented towards exporting and expanding internationally. In the eyes of the Chinese government, any enterprise dealing with technology was a welcome endeavor, which is why Ren received an extremely generous loan from a state bank to start Huawei. He got eight and a half million dollars and hired 14 people right off the bat. The initial plan was simple. Huawei would import switching gears from Hong Kong and then sell them back home in China. That's how virtually all Chinese companies functioned back then. They'd import foreign technology, usually through a joint venture, and then they'd do their best to reverse engineer it and to start making it themselves. It's pretty clear that that is exactly what Huawei did. During its first few years, it had 500 people working in R&D and only 200 in production. It should come as no surprise that one of Ren's first client was the Chinese military, whose leader he convinced that owning your own telecommunications hardware was a matter of national security. Once the government contracts started coming in, so did the regular supply of government funding, which to Ren's credit he did not embezzle. Instead, he invested in expanding Huawei's R&D and production capacity, 
sometimes even operating at a loss to do so. On the market side, Ren's priority was getting market share, so he priced his products so competitively that just 10 years after its founding, Huawei had overtaken Ren's former employer as the largest telecommunications company in China. Now there is a lot that made Ren's company uniquely suited for rapid expansion. To start, he adopted a structure somewhat similar to the capitalist shareholding we're all familiar with, by allowing his employees to invest in the company based on their performance. That was Ren's way of not only attracting talent, but keeping it. Although amidst the very lax labor market at the time, Ren could enforce some pretty questionable working standards. The employees of Huawei were subject to long work hours in a toxic work environment, with schedules going from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. In fact, in its early years, Huawei's offices were actually equipped with mattresses, as it was regular for employees to work late, sleep in the office, and then wake up to continue working the next morning. The almost fanatical loyalty and dedication of its workforce allowed Huawei to excel in one particular activity, corporate espionage. Now, Chinese theft of intellectual property is nothing new, but Huawei did take it to a new level. In 2003, for example, they copied over a million lines of code from Cisco routers, which they then used to make their own product line. Another example from 2007 goes even further when an employee of Motorola was discovered to have been sending IP directly to Huawei executives. The nature of Huawei's behavior is truly systemic, not least because the company actually has an internal messaging board where employees can share stolen competitor secrets, and depending on their value, they can actually get bonuses for them. Now, the amount of allegations vastly outnumber what has been proven so far, but even the amount we do know paints a very bleak picture. It is only Huawei's extreme dedication to competitive pricing that allows international clients to overcome their reputation. For most clients abroad, the name Huawei was totally unrecognizable, even as recently as 10 years ago. It was in 2009 that Huawei truly made it big abroad. That was when they were awarded the contract to build Sweden's 4G network, which honestly came as a big surprise at the time considering the fact that Sweden itself is home to one of the world's biggest telecommunications companies, Ericsson. Over the next decade, Huawei's hardware would become the foundation for networks across the world, especially in developing markets where Huawei's ties to the Chinese government were less of a concern. The extent of Huawei's international growth has been so rapid, to the point where they're now earning over $100 billion in revenue from 170 countries, that the West is actively conspiring to bring them down. The recent ban by the US is just the opening salvo in what can easily develop into a technological cold war between the countries economically aligned with China and those under US influence. Since telecommunications networks form the backbone of the modern economy, it is only natural that countries deem this a matter of national security. Now, the fact that the US has a geopolitical incentive to keep Huawei down is another question, but Huawei isn't doing itself any favors by being so secretive. In one of his few public statements, Ren said that Huawei has never received any request from the government to provide him proper information, but nobody was really convinced by his words. Since under Chinese cybersecurity law, any Chinese company must provide the government with access to its data, it's no surprise that the global community is skeptical. In addition, Huawei's employee ownership makes it exempt from many of the more detailed public reports most other public multinationals have to release. It is very telling that, for a company operating globally, there is a very stark lack of diversity in Huawei's management. All 17 board members are Chinese, have no degrees from non-Chinese universities, and have all been with Huawei for over 20 years. All these factors are conspiring against Huawei, but it's not yet clear whether the politics will overcome the economic incentives for most of the world. What is clear, though, is that online security is becoming an increasingly important aspect of modern life. And if you want to keep all your stuff safe online, well, then you should probably consider using services like Dashlane. It's easy to just use one password everywhere, but what's even easier is to let Dashlane generate strong passwords and then enter them for you across all your devices. On top of that, Dashlane also comes with a VPN service. And to show you just how awesome they are, I'm gonna give you a free trial of Dashlane if you register using the link in the description and 10% off their premium service to the first 200 people that use the code BUSINESSCASUAL. Anyway, thank you for watching. Make sure to follow me on my Instagram page 
and to like this video if you enjoyed it. We're gonna see each other again in two weeks, and until then, stay smart.